स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया morning continuing with our discussion of classic hollywood better known as the golden age of hollywood and we were also talking about the period when hays code was in existence so yesterday we were discussing a couple of directors uh, of course the biggest and the most uh, extravagant of all directors uh, during that period was uh, cecil de mill and also after that we uh, looked at how frank capra started making all those very popular sentimental sentimentalist and uh, populist movies uh, today we are going to again continue with our discussion of narrative editing characterization in uh, the golden age of hollywood during the golden age of hollywood how most movies uh, or at least the most well known movies fell in the category of magnum opuses and how studios controlled stars so star system or stu studio controlled star system those are the uh, key features that we will we will be discussing key filmmakers yesterday we talked about cecil b demille and frank capra today we will be talking about george stevens alaya kazan william wyler billy wilder George Cukor you I gave you the homework and um Nicholas Ray So um William Wyler he was also of German origin yesterday we were talking about how several influential directors of that period were of German origin having fled the oppressive Nazi regime uh, during the 1930s Fritz Lang was one of those directors if you remember when we are talking about cinema and modernism fritz lang hmm? so william wyler he worked with greg toland there was a partnership there was a successful collaboration between william wyler and greg toland the cinematographer of citizen kane and uh, citizen kane if you remember is today remembered for its deep focus and montages and william wyler too is known for his use of for his employment of deep focus so you have to give some credit to greg toland also so use deep focus and focused on background details you remember that deep focus was not just focusing on tight close ups many directors did that we are going to look at for example cinema of george stevens in particular who believed in using tight close ups beautiful close ups uh, people like william wyler and orson welles on the other hand believed in deep focus where foreground was as important as uh, um, uh, uh, background was as important as foreground and uh, all the details attention to all details in the frame uh, uh, was important um William Wyler is also known for avoiding close-ups. Okay, so he did not believe again in beautifying or prettifying faces, which George Stevens was known for. And if you compare him to uh, Frank Capra, William Wyler's most important con contribution is avoiding sentimentality and simplistic utopian kind of cinema. so he is more sophisticated more elegant sensitive yet he avoids sentimentality the capraesque sentimentality his major films uh, one is jezebel with betty davis jezebel was an open competition to gone with the wind and uh, betty davis was much appreciated for her uh, turn um, in this movie along with henry fonda but also important is that uh, 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 she competed she was one of the uh, uh, contenders for the role of scarlet o'hara and she didn't get the part 
William, uh, Vivian Leigh famous, famously got the part, but uh, Jezebel again is a tale of a southern belle and she was much appreciated for the role. Uh, William Wyler's other important films, Wuthering Heights, based on Emily Bronte's novel, starring Laurence Olivier, The Letter and The Little Foxes, again with Betty Davis. Mrs. Miniver, this is one of the most popular films of William Wyler and uh, the best years of our lives. It is about a family whose lives changes once the father of the family returns after the war, the second world war. The heiress based on a short story, Washington Square by Henry James, starring Monticliffe and Olivia D. Haviland. William Wyler uh, proved his versati versatility with all kinds of genre films. He also experimented with noir, film noir that you are already familiar with exploring the darker aspects of personality and life. And then he also made a couple of romantic comedies and the most popular among those uh, rom romantic comedies is Gregory Peck and Audrey Hepburn star a Roman holiday. This was Audrey Hepburn's debut movie, which won her the Oscar and uh, William Wyler shot uh, major portions of the film on location in Rome. His grandest achievement, however, was Banner starring Charleston Heston and it is an epic. For a long time, the record remained unbroken. Um, for earning 11 Academy Awards. Billy Wilder, some like it hot, seven year itch and all those memorable films. He was born in Austria. So, again one of those directors, one of those immigrant directors, Frank Capra was a Sicilian, remember that. Uh, William Wilder and then Billy Wilder in the same league. Um, he had to leave Germany because of his Jewish background, moved to Hollywood in 1934 and started his career as a screenwriter. Um, see, Billy Wilder uh, today may appear dated to many people, because his most famous films are quite unsubtle, quite melodramatic. We are going to look at what is melodrama as well, but then he is also known for uh, depiction of misanthropic cynicism and skepticism. Perhaps that could have been his uh, experience with the Nazi regime. So, that, but he also played to the gallery and often made melodramatic and over the top kind of films. One of his most famous film, Sunset Boulevard, is about uh, an aging fading actress played by Gloria Sonson. Uh, who lives in an ivory tower. She is a, in the movie, she is, we, we are told that she belonged to the silent age era. She was a huge star and then of course, as it happens with most actresses, her career is started fading away with age and also with the advent of talking pictures. And uh, now, she lives uh, all by herself with only one butler and later on we uh, learned that butler, she was once married to that butler, who was also instrumental in uh, giving a push to her career, because he was one of the greatest directors of that period. So, what an irony okay? and it is a scathing commentary on Hollywood. Okay, people, how relationships change, how hierarchies change, how power structures change. Our lady, however, uh, does not uh, uh, look or fails to look at reality in the eye and still believes that she is huge. You know what is the famous line in the movie? I am still big, it is the pictures that got small. Concluding lines of the movie, of course, all right Mr. Dimmel, because she is now so uh, deluded, she murders or she uh, you know guns down her lover as played by William Holden, who is a screenwriter, a struggling screenwriter and he keeps her in good humor, because she is supporting him financially. But then when he falls in love with a younger woman, 
more saner woman, she uh, our uh, heroine, she shoots him dead and that is the way the movie ends. And while she is taken away by the police uh, and the camera, cameras are all uh, on her and pictures are being taken by the press photographers and uh, police photographers and her parting shot is all right Mr. DeMille, that is a reference to Cecil with DeMille, I am ready for my close up. So, the extent of megalomania, the extent of delusion about her own uh, stardom. So, that is a commentary. So, it is still remains his uh, one of his most watchable films and how it is a, it's a noir of course, it is a film noir fits uh, very neatly into that category. And Louis B. Mayer wanted Billy Wilder to be publicly thrashed and tarred and feathered for uh, mis, you know the, uh, depicting Hollywood uh, so neg negatively, because Hollywood is portrayed as a fake, as a phony dream factory and Louis B. Mayer felt that he is biting the hands that feeding him and he announced that this man deserves to be whipped in public for making a movie like this. His major films, all very important films okay, for one reason or the other. Double Indemnity, which is uh, again a film noir starring Barbara Steinbeck, Ace in the Hole, Sabrina with uh, Humphrey Bogart and Audrey Hepburn, The Seven Year Itch, Marilyn Monroe, Some Like It Hot is the movie in which Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon are in disguise as women, remember? Okay, you must watch Some Like It Hot. And Marilyn Monroe famously plays um, Sugar Cane in an all girl band. And these two heroes, they are on the run from gangsters. They have witnessed the murder taking place on Valentine's Day. And then they, they are on the run and uh, there is no way for them and they dress up as women and join this all girl band headed by Marilyn Monroe. And then the comedy. Okay. The Apartment, again with Jack Lemmon, Shirley MacLaine and one of his most serious films, The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, where you have young Sherlock Holmes and it is a romantic movie. George Stevens, again a major director of uh, the golden Hollywood golden age period, 1904 to 1975. Major themes of his films, the outsider uh, is the protagonist, somewhere and so, uh, out of nowhere uh, a person just walks in, in a setup and then he takes over, how he looks at, at, the, uh, at the society around him so there, and how he disturbs the equilibrium there. So, that is the major theme in uh, George Stevens most movies. His movies are also about uh, subversion of the great American dream and about repressed longings. There is a reason for all these things if you read up on George Stevens. Uh, his, uh, his movies definitely are highly moral, but then the morality is much more complex, much more ambiguous as compared to the simple utopian fantasies of Frank Capra and others. Uh, he was highly regarded by his uh, peers in Hollywood, but uh, the French critics, the very powerful critics of Kaidu cinema, they disregarded him and they dismissed him off. Um, they never thought of him as uh, an author. Okay. And Andrew Serres, who represented the Kair critics in America, he too never uh, thought much of George Stevens. Today, George Stevens is regarded as one of the most influential filmmakers of that period. His major films and he too explored or he too experimented with all kinds of genres. So, there is an adventure picture called Gangadeen with Cary Grant based on a, a work by Rudyard Kipling. A Place in the Sun, one of his best regarded film based on Theodore Dreiser's American Tragedy, starring Monty Clift and Elizabeth Taylor. 
again this is about the subversion of the great American dream. You must uh, watch Place in the Sun. And then of course, when we were talking about George Stevens and uh, compared him to William Wyler, so George Stevens is known for using beautiful close ups and uh, now it is accepted that uh, the way he has used close ups of Monty Clift and Elizabeth Taylor in a place in the sun, no one, no other director utilized close up as a technique so brill brilliantly before and after. His other famous movies, Shane, which is a western starring Ellen Ladd, and it has the famous exchange Shane in a restaurant, in a bar, not a restaurant, sorry, in a bar, says to one of the thugs in the, in the town, You speaking to me? And uh, uh, the thug responds, I do not see nobody else standing there. It is a, and after that, it was used famously by taxi driver Martin Scorsese. What are those lines? You talking to me? Well, I am the only one here. Okay. Um, Giant, again a famous movie based on a novel by Edna Ferber, starring who? James Dean, Rock Hudson and Elizabeth Taylor. It was shot entirely on location in Texas and one of the three movies in which James Dean starred. Elia Kazan, 1909 to 2003. Again, like George Stevens, comes from the New York theatre background. He was one of the key founders of the actor's studio and a key supporter of the method school of acting and direction. It is Stanislavski method. Remember when we, when we were discussing the method in one of our earlier sessions. Most of his films are adaptations of plays and novels. He was an acclaimed theatre director. Much before he burst on the scene as a major filmmaker, he was already a superstar director on Broadway. So, that is his value. Uh, the major theme in all his works, uh, he is interested in social realism of course, because of his background, the New York theatre method acting and a studio actor, which was a socialist kind of a set, set up. So, socialist, uh, social realism and sympathy for the working class, main themes in the works of Alaya Kazan, also about sexual repression. The great American dramatist Arthur Miller and Alaya Kazan had a, a long abiding friendship. So, uh, um, Kazan also directed two of uh, Miller's most successful and popular plays, All My Sons and Death of a Salesman, that was on Broadway, that was on a stage, both highly successful uh, uh, plays. But after that, there was a fallout uh, during the McCarthy period, Arthur Miller refused to testify against fellow communists, whereas Kazan did. And why did Kazan did? Uh, why did he testify at all? Because there was more at a stake. Kazan had much more to lose than anyone else, because by that time, he was already a major Hollywood director. And he knew that his career as a film director would be over, if he did not testify. So, purely uh, materialistic concerns. And he uh, testified and after that, uh, he was not blacklisted, uh, some people were like Dashiell Hammett and even Arthur Miller for a while, but uh, Kazan was more or, more or less ostracized by his earlier friends. Uh, Miller, uh, while he was on good terms with Kazan, had written a screenplay about the Brooklyn waterfront. He had done lot of research and the, uh, the script was called The Hook and Kazan was to direct it for Columbia Pictures. But then, after his uh, refusal to testify before HUAC, Arthur Miller was fired. Kazan was still uh, there, uh, he remained on, on board and uh, Kazan and Miller stopped talking to each other for a very long time, till Miller uh, came out with his play After the Fall, 1964, which 
Kazan directed again. So, Miller's script of uh, the hook, whatever happened to it, it is based on the waterfront. Henry Kahn, who, uh, who was the owner of Columbia Picture, he revised the script, modeled, remodeled it, molded it to an extent and then turned into on the waterfront. Eventually, the movie uh, was uh, made as on the waterfront, one of the greatest pictures of Alaya Kazan starring Marlon Brando. East of Eden, uh, Alaya Kazan is credited with introducing James Dean to the movie world. James Dean was essentially a theater actor belonging to the actor studio in New York, but uh, uh, Alaya Kazan was in instrumental in bringing him to Hollywood and the result was East of Eden, which a movie which most of you are familiar with, I hope. Yeah. A street car named Desire, Marlon Brando did the part on stage and Kazan directed it on stage and then later he repeated the same star cast. The only exception was Vivian Lee, who was cast as Blanche Dubois in the movie version of it, who acted on the stage in the same part, Jessica Tendi, but then she was never considered a big star. So, she lost the part, she was not taken because uh, she, she lacked the star value. So, that is how Hollywood functions. Gentleman's agreement with Gregory Peck, a face in the crowd, another very interesting movie 1957, it is about the games media plays in making somebody, a non-entity into a celebrity. Uh, Viva Zapata, what is it about? It is a cowboy, cowboy movie set in Mexico, starring Marlon Brando. Okay. Baby doll, based on a play by Tennessee Williams, again like streetcar named Desire. Um, Wild River with Monty Clift, who was another favorite uh, actor of uh, Alaya Kazan another uh, act, great actor from the actor's studio from New York. Splendor in the Grass with Warren Beatty and uh, one of his last pictures was The Last Tycoon. We were talking about this, this movie starring Robert De Niro, based on the life and times of Irving Thalberg, the MGM uh, executive. George Cukor and this was the homework I gave you. So, what are his movies? Good, My Fair Lady, George Cooker, who has been labeled as a woman's director. <laughs> yes, he directed a movie called The Women and he was forever labeled as a woman's director, but it was also used in a very derisive way because uh, he was a closet gay and he later came out in the open. There was nothing ambiguous about it, he was gay and uh, uh, most of his films are thrillers, screwball, romantic comedies, even musicals. He was known as a women's director and most of the leading ladies would be nominated for the academy awards. He himself received five best director nominations. He directed Greta Garbo in Camille. And another great movie of his is The Philadelphia Story with Cary Grant, James Stewart and Katherine Hepburn. Very witty, very smart, very elegant. So, that is what that is George Cukor's basic style. Gaslight with Ingrid Bergman, A Star is Born with Judy Garland and then My Fair Lady, his greatest achievement. Nicholas Ray. 1911 to 79, what did he make? Rebel Without a Cause, most popular movie, Rebel Without a Cause. He was celebrated as an author by the critics of Kaidu cinema and uh, Jean-Liu Godard called Nicolas Ray the highest and the greatest of praises, cinema is Nicolas Ray. Interestingly, Nicolas Ray studied architecture under Frank Lloyd Wright and uh, he is known for his use of color and his uh, preference for using cinema scope mode of projection. We have been talking about cinema scope, remember? 
like Kazan, he was also involved in the left uh, wing theatre in New York. He was closely associated with Kazan for a very long time. And again, like Kazan, some of the major themes that uh, appear in his films are you know, the motif of the tragic hero, the loner, the misfit, okay, who arrives on the scene, individual versus society. His most significant films in are They Live by Night, In a Lonely Place, Johnny Guitar and of course, most famous is Rebel Without a Cause, James Dean and Natalie Wood. Is there anyone in this class who has not watched Rebel Without a Cause? Yeah, you must watch it. If you know East of Eden, you must watch Rebel Without a Cause as well. It is uh, one of uh, James Dean's most celebrated, I mean he has worked only in three films, okay, so it would not take too much of an effort. Giant by George Stevens may be a little difficult to watch, because uh, um, it does not have a coherent plot. Giant lacks, one of the major criticisms against Giant and although George Stevens won the best director award, the academy award for the movie, but um, Giant is still remembered as a movie that meanders too much, okay, it does not have a, a focused plot. But Rebel Without a Cause is a highly watchable movie. Okay, so, on a, 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 after the great directors, let us talk about the classic narrative. We have been talking about it for a quite a while. And one of the uh, phrases attached to classic narrative is, is based on an affirmative consequential model. That is, it followed that cause and effect approach. The story demands a closure. Golden age of Hollywood was also the age of magnum opuses. It is widely believed that if Gone with the Wind or Ben-Hur or Ten Commandments are attempted today, it is not possible to make them, okay, because of the sheer extravaganza. They were possible at one point, but not anymore. Um, now, star system, stars who are so important for a movie and how studios controlled stars. So, some of the greatest all time stars like Betty Davis, like Cary Grant, like Katherine Hepburn and uh, Clark Gable, they were all under contract by uh, studios and that is one of the features of classic Hollywood. With the emergence of new Hollywood and soon we are going to discuss new Hollywood period also. So, these are the major binaries, how stars became more and more independent after a certain period, once the studios started losing control over them. But there was a point when stars could not do anything without uh, the permission of the studio, everything was controlled, everything, even the personal lives were governed by the studios. We have been talking about ed editing techniques. So, uh, classic Hollywood period, of course, is known for the linear narration. If you remember what is linear narration, linear editing technique or devices are those where which do not call any attention to themselves. Then we come to that period where uh, uh, when uh, Godard uses jump cut very effectively. Montage, of course, is a way of calling attention to whatever is happening, deep focus too, but more or less editing during the na classic Hollywood period was linear and continuous, where individual shots were ordered according to the tempora temporal sequence of events. So, no jumping back and forth in time, it was all very linear. So, ordered according to the temporal sequence of events, that is what we mean by linear editing. Now, uh, if we had stars and why did we have stars, because the stars guaranteed 
box office returns and the stars had to be projected in a certain way. So, images of stars were very important, okay, how they were in real life and how they would be on screen, everything was controlled by the studio. So, there is a very interesting uh, story about Elizabeth Taylor, why did she marry so many times? Why did she marry first time at all? She was married, who was the first husband? Nick Hilton, okay, he was the owner of the Hilton hotels, okay, the, the sign of uh, the, the Hilton group of hotels and she was married off by age 17 and why was she married off at age 17? Because MGM um, who controlled her, she was under contract by the MGM studio, they were just coming out with a picture starring Elizabeth Taylor called Father of the Bride. Have you heard of the title? Spencer Tracy is the father. The bride is played by a young Elizabeth Taylor, who was just 16 or 17 at that point. And the studio felt that uh, Elizabeth Taylor does not have a grown up image. How do we release a movie about uh, Elizabeth Taylor getting married, okay, when uh, she does not even have a proper relationship? So, the best way is to marry her off and find a groom, an appropriate groom. So, her this match between Nick Hilton and Elizabeth Taylor was made not by her parents, but by the studio bosses. So, that was the extent of control. So, if you read Elizabeth Taylor's uh, biography, how to be a movie star, you will come across all these interesting tidbits. So, heroes had to be uh, of certain stature and uh, uh, they were projected in in a certain manner on screen. So, image of stars was very important. Billy Wilder famously said, you know what he said about his stars? Billy Wilder, never try to change the image of a star. It is a far cry from that New York method acting, okay, where stars uh, do whatever possible to change their image. But uh, Billy Wilder believed that a star should be a star. So, Marilyn Monroe should be a star and never try to change Marilyn Monroe. She is a good comic actor. So, that is the way she should be. And they acted in two movies together, both classics, Seven Year Itch and Some Like It Hot. Yes, that is what he said. She is Marilyn Monroe, people like to see her in a certain way. And Marilyn was desperate to change her image. If you remember, there was a period when she uh, wanted to be taken seriously as an actor. And then one of her last movies was Misfits, the Misfits written by her husband Arthur Miller. And uh, it was a very serious movie, where she was given a good dramatic part. But then by and large Hollywood believed in uh, maintaining a star's image on screen, that is the way. So, John Wayne, the eternal cowboy, the eternal western hero should be projected as the western hero in all his movies. So, movie after movie, he would be the same John Wayne. Gary Cooper, high minded and principled. So, that is the image they carried with them and that is what show, uh, reflected in the films as well. So, Gary Cooper in high noon, high minded, high principled hero. Okay, um, to maintain this stardom, it was very important that actors should be made to look as beautiful as possible. Their bodies, their faces were very important. I mean, till the advent of these method actors, looks were important for actors. So, close up shots, classic Hollywood employed plenty of close up shots, because the actors were so good looking. Exchanging looks between characters, that was extremely important. A certain look has to be there. You know, you, you know the principle of mise en scene, how the scene is constructed. Okay, so, exchange of looks. Eye line matching shots, some of you will be doing presentation soon. So, think of eye, what is eye line matching shots. So, when we are talking about ex characters exchanging looks tight close ups, 
So, if you look at the posters of a film like Notorious, A Place in the Sun, Casablanca, you will understand what I am trying to say. So, actor's image, how important it was, if Marilyn was a comic actor, then she had to be projected that way uh, over and again. Audrey Hepburn was essentially known for her style, her flawless, faultless style. She patronized uh, the Italian fashion designer Givenchy and uh, she was known for her classy dress sense, sophisticated style. So, that was very obvious in all her films. Sabrina, for example, is the ultimate homage to her style. Roman Holiday and then of course, you have breakfast at Tiffany's. So, actor's image was extremely important. Yeah, yeah, we will be talking about Hitchcock as well. Hitchcock is at the center. Hitchcock is always at the center. He is one of the greatest and most popular, most successful. Anyone else you would like to talk about? We will be discussing Hitch Hitchcock uh, in another session, only a class on Hitchcock. So, from here, uh, I would like to take you to the concept of melodrama. Melodrama, of course, we, are, we Indians are no strangers to melodrama in cinema, but classic Hollywood was also quite fond of melodramatic situations. This highly popular genre is often used in a very derisive way. It is very melodramatic, that means it is over the top, it is not subtle. So, we have most of us do not like to watch melodramatic performances or plots, but it is extremely popular and there are reasons for its popularity. Uh, we often believe that uh, melodrama is that kind of uh, genre that believes in manipulating audience's emotions. So, how do you manipulate audience's emotions? Give me some example, you have been watching so much all these techniques, so much of discussion on cinema, very soon I will be giving you very tough assignments to write, very tough quizzes to at attempt. So, you have to tell me, yeah, now I have your attention. So, tell me how, how does melodrama, how do, how do filmmakers manipulate the audience's emotions? Focus on them please. Yeah? Okay, music comes later. What else? Exactly, close up shots, close up shots, linear editing, cause and effect, right? Mise en scène. Give me some great melodramatic directors you know. Let us not talk about Hollywood uh, at this point. Let us talk about our own situation. Who are the greatest of all? Okay, why do you think money is melodramatic? Give me reasons. Most of the movies contain this like close up shots and uh, they do not like do that many that much experiment with uh, the linearity, the way of storytelling. Okay, uh, point taken. Anyone would like to contest him? My again question is, I'll repeat it. Um, how much do you think? How far do you think Mani Ratnam exploits or manipulates the audience's rea emotions? How much does he do? To what extent does it? I'm not contesting you at all. I'm just questioning the audience here. Srinath, any comments here? The emotional and sentiment, like the seriousness of politics are the bit that makes it a very. So, all of us agree here that his, his kind of cinema, his brand of cinema is highly manipulative and melodramatic. The master of melodrama, nobody manipulates emotions as well as Karan Johar, okay, and that too in all very glamorized situations. Give me an example where Karan Johar makes use of music, mise en scene, characters, close-ups, 
etcetera. Okay, give me a shot, give me a scene. Scene of Shahrukh Khan in that movie with that song. Okay. When he comes into the house and his mother will do that dramatic turn with a thali and then he will close up on The mother is always with a thali as far as I can remember in that movie. Yeah. So that's Mizo song. Yeah, mother with a thali. I mean, what could be more emotional? In Diva, the mother is always going to the temple. You know, the younger son, uh, the dutiful. Obedient, the beautiful and beautiful son is, uh, is so obedient, he would always go up the stairs with his mother. The rebellious son would never do so. So, there is a binary there, you know, up and down. So, he is always down. Yeah. But he is not that melodramatic. Okay. He tries, he does try to bring on that Drashtian element of alienation. But in Karan, Karan Johar's film, however popular they may be, there is an attempt to manipulate the audience's emotions. One classic movie, I will give you an example, Mother India. Okay. Mother India, which is a movie of the 50s starring the great Nargis, directed by the great Mehboob Khan. And if you watch it, okay, it is a, it's a text that is often taught at film schools. Okay. But if you, if you watch the movie, you will find that there is every attempt to extract every emotion out of the audience. There is a, the story uh, takes place in a rural India and we are told that the husband has left this family abandoned because he loses both his arms in an accident and um, the lady Nargis is left with a couple of children and some of the children die on the way because of starvation and natural causes and whatever and then there is a I mean, this is the mother of all melodramatic scenes because she has lost her bulls as well. So, she now ties herself to the cart and ploughs the field and that is mother India. Yeah, so, and it is it's a highly regarded movie. I mean, Nargis came to be regarded as mother India after that, the lady in white. She is India, symbolizes every virtue of a good Indian woman. So, you see that is the way mother, so the sacrificing mother, okay, a mother who, can, who represses her own longings or desires, okay, the mother who is willing to, he, she does not hesitate to shoot her own son dead by the end of the movie, just like in Diwar. So, Diwar was nothing but a more modern uh, version of mother India, so, an ideal woman. yeah. Of, like, in order to manipulate the audience effectively, don't we need to use certain stereotypes or certain classic types? So, so that the audience sacrificing mother is a stereotype. So, like a movie that tries to sort of flesh out a character or flesh out the character in a slightly grey way would not succeed as well. We will never succeed. Therefore, Citizen Kane. Okay, you have Citizen Kane, uh, which is a very uh, uh, Charles Foster Kane is not a hero in the classic sense. He is not the high minded, high principled Gary Cooper kind of hero, John Wayne kind of hero. He is not fighting corrupt system, corrupt order, corrupt establishment. He is a highly ambitious man, megalomaniac, shades of grey. So, the movie is anything but melodrama. So, it will never reach that, those heights. Love, sex and dhoka raises several issues, but it will never be a blockbuster. It is not melodramatic. But kabhi khushi kabhi gum, unbeatable, unsurpassable. Okay, there can there is nothing as melodramatic as that movie. And the song plays in the background at every emotional situation, and the number of times it plays. Any other comment? And we are we are a nation of melodramatic cinema, so we can go on and on about this. Amar Akbar Anthony, the other day I was talking about lost and found formula. What happens? In the first reel, uh, father, a poor man, uh, loses all his three young sons. So, one is brought up by a Hindu, another by a Muslim, so that is Akbar, and the third by a priest, that is Anthony Bachchan. Okay, so, Amar Akbar, 
Anthony. Hmm? Now, uh, they are all uh, grown up somewhere in their mid twenties or something. So, Amar is a police officer, Akbar is a performer, singer, kawal, whatever and Anthony is a bootlegger, you know a small time goon. Now, um, there is a road accident where the mother who is now blind, okay, she is also separated. So, everyone is separated from everyone in this family and mother meets with an accident and she is in dire need of blood. So, what happens? These three sons arrive on the scene without knowing that this lady is their mother. Okay. They do not recognize, mother does not recognize her sons, of course, it has been a long time, the sons do not know that this lady is their mother, but somehow it so happens that all of them happen to be in the hospital at the same time when mother is brought for treatment, she is unconscious, she needs blood, all three sons donate their blood to this mother. Okay. And then she, we are shown a classic mise en scene, where uh, there is a bottle of blood and sons are donating their blood and all through the same tube. Okay. Uh, it is very interesting medically that the entire family have the same blood group okay. uh, and there is a very sentimental song playing in the background. Yes, they separate with a song and they are united with a song and the uh, and all of them remember <laughs> every word of the song and the yeah Karan Arjun of course takes the cake and the bakery and the baker everything so Karan Arjun Ram Lakhan okay, so as melodramatic as they come so uh, we'll continue with this tomorrow thank you very much.